Okay, well, how many are excited about getting into the Word today? Are you? About six or seven of you. That's awesome. The rest of you, just go get free lattes in the cafe. And I'm just kidding. Father, I pray that you open up your Word today. Lord, as I talk about overcoming rejection. Lord, I know this is a, a tough topic, and it's a good topic, Lord, because you have overcome it, and there is victory here. Uh, but there's also pain here, Lord, that uh, even if it's resolved, there's still the scars, Lord, the, the wounds below, below the wounds, Lord, that still are sensitive. Um, I pray that you'd bring us to a place of healing and restoration. And I pray that blind eyes would be able to see. Sometimes it's hard for us to see, Lord, what's going on in our own hearts. And we need you to bring the light, Lord, into our darkness. And illuminate, Lord, what it is you're doing so that we can even know how to repent or how we can bring our cares before you, our hurts and pains before you so that we can be restored, Lord, in this broken world. And so, Lord, prepare our hearts and let these scriptures come to life, Lord. Help us to overcome rejection. In Jesus' name, do I hear an amen? Amen. 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 Well, how many have felt rejection before? Several of you. You know, there, there's that feeling of being excluded, you know, unworthy, unwanted, not being able to fit in a situation, um, you know, and unresolved rejection can lead to being self-critical. Uh, it can start to isolate us. We start to believe who we are and who we are not based on the voices in our head or the voices of the world rather than hearing the voice of the Lord that spoke to his son in Christ and said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. And we turn to all kinds of things and we act in ways after a while that perpetuate uh, rejection. And I think of all the things that, that cause rejection, you know, you know, you could just not be the popular person. Um, you know, maybe you're not weren't gifted in sports or art or whatever it is. You weren't smart enough. Uh, maybe you were poor in your neighborhood. You had shabby clothes and didn't fit in that way. Maybe you're not the best looking. Maybe you're overweight or maybe you're too thin. Whatever it was, you became unpopular. Most people have experienced some kind of breakup before. Where you're in a relationship and you're planning your life with this person and you're thinking this is what's going to happen and you have it in your mind and you, you anticipate it and all of a sudden you're, you've been divorced and there's a brokenness there. It's like a rejection um, or just a relationship. Maybe you're engaged and thinking you're going to be in a relationship and you're planning and it didn't, didn't work out the way that you thought it would. Maybe you're the one who failed in your mind or... They're the one who failed, or you both failed, or some combination of the two. Um, you know, maybe it's with a, with a child um, who's rejected you um, in relationship. Um, these are kinds of things that happen in a sin-filled world. I, I think of the finished picture when God describes us with him in relationship, in absolute unity, where he'll never leave us or never forsake us. And where we have unity with one another. There's no more gossip. There's no more slander. There's no more rejection. That's the picture that God paints of what eternity is like. But yet he deposits his spirit in us to move us toward this unity with and, and heartfelt um, acceptance you know, by his spirit. And anything else from the world is a step down from that. And, you know, and before I got saved, I'd have moments where I think, you know, because I didn't know God, I was an atheist. Um, I, I didn't really compare, you know, 
you know, was I rejected or not rejected? I just kind of pick myself up no matter what. And then I'd have moments where I go, no, I'm not rejected. This is good. Life is good. And then all of a sudden, relationships would go sour. And then I'd go, man, I feel rejected. And I, I wouldn't really know how to contemplate it. And, you know, the, the, the hard thing about doing a sermon and doing messages, and, and by the way, this is not all pastors do is prepare messages. I don't know if you know that. I've had people think, you know, we don't just sit around and prepare messages. Um, that would be a fun life to just do that. Um, but as you do prepare messages, you, you can't just come up here and just share, you know, nothing and just kind of give you material. You have to be transparent about your life. And I hate that this week. And the reason I hate that is because I don't want to have to share my own rejection stories. <laughs> I already feel rejected thinking about them. How many can relate to what I'm saying? It's kind of like it's the last thing I want to do is share them. And I'm not saying that as a ploy. I'm just sharing honestly what I, what I think. And, but I, but I, I asked the Lord. I said, Lord, I will share it. If you want me to share it, I will share stuff. You know, but I, I literally, I, had, I think I had a lot of rejection as a kid. Um, even when I got saved, my wife used to tell me all the time, she said, Eric, you filter things through rejection. You know, someone will say something and then you'll just take it as rejection and then you'll go a certain way and, and respond as if they did reject you. And even if they didn't, it doesn't matter. In your mind, they did. And so you respond that way. And, and it's taken a long time, you know, um, up until last week, I had none of this problem. No, but, but it is something that I've, that I've grown in, but, but I, I can so relate to it. And when I see it pop up in my heart, it, it's almost disappointing. I was thinking, gosh, I thought I was done with that. And then all of a sudden, I'll feel some kind of rejection. You know, I, I've shared that my dad, who I've worked things out with, but, but my dad was a, was a strong disciplinarian, if you could call it that. Um, he was out of control um, with his anger. And um, when he disciplined me, he always hit us in the face. And, and it wasn't always open-fisted. It was a lot of different ways that he did. And I, I remember in my teenage years, I had a lot of acne. And, you know, probably between 13 and 17. And it probably didn't help that I ate Doritos every day. Um, yeah, I never put the two and two together. Um, but... What happened was, is I, I remember this one time, one specific time, but this happened quite a few times. That I, I was starting to get acne in my face, and um, my dad had hit me several times in the face. I don't even remember what it was. It doesn't really matter. But I felt already humiliated and rejected from my dad because when I looked in his eyes when he disciplined me, I, I didn't look, I didn't see the look. He may have thought, the, thought the, in his heart that he was doing the right thing, but I saw the, the rage that he had, uh, where he was out of control. And like, like the discipline wasn't for me. And it was good for me to actually read the Bible later and find out that God disciplines me for my good. That when he disciplines, it's for my good, my long-term goodness. And I, I appreciate that. But I didn't see that. And I remember several times of just being my face being so swollen and just being humiliated going to school. I was thinking, man, I look like crap. You know? And I tried covering it up and nothing worked. I just had these big, huge welts on my head And you know when you're in junior high, people don't really, they're not like sensitive to you. I grew up in a, the school I went to was, um, had a lot of uh, gang violence um, starting from the seventh grade on up. And I remember thinking, you know what, I'm going to pretend like this is not going to bug me at all. You know, I can be disciplined in sports, I'll be disciplined in my mind. You know, I'm fine. Things are fine. No problem. It doesn't bother me. And that just didn't work for me because it did bother me. I felt everything deeply. I still do. And then I thought, you know what? I don't care. 
Who cares what anybody says? You know, who cares what anybody thinks? You know? You know, and I had, I got in a couple fights as a result of it. I had this one gang, I won't mention, you know, who, one guy in that gang, I had grown up with him, he knew me and I knew me, and he just had to get in my face, so to speak, about it. And just start, started mocking me and him and 10 other guys um, just surrounded me. And I was just thinking, I'm going to kill somebody. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to kill somebody here. And I literally had it in my mind. And they knew how unpredictable. What? I'm not crying. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> that was thoughtful. And... The problem is, is that when I started to pretend, can you just say that word, pretend? I started to pretend like it didn't bother me, that that would overcome this rejection. I didn't really identify it with the word rejection. I just knew that it made me feel isolated and alone. And I felt like I had nobody at home who could relate to this. And my older brothers were pretty psychotic. You know, my, my oldest brother, my foster brother, and... You know, it was a hell's angel, and they were all high all the time. And I felt like I had nobody to turn to, so I just pretend like it didn't bug me. And you'd probably think I was healed because, you know, just like, hey, no big deal. I'm fine, man, no problem, you know. But deep down, I wasn't healed. I was totally broken still. I was broken. I was walking around broken. It's rejection. It's... It starts to surround you. And pretty soon it becomes self-fulfilling. You start acting like someone who should be rejected and you get rejected more. And it just creates more and more of a cycle. Can you relate to this? Um, you know, I, I'm sure you have your whole story, you know, that's different. You know? And I'm going to start off with the scripture here in Matthew 22, 20, 37. Most of you know this. They asked Jesus with the greatest commandment. And he goes the opposite way of what I just mentioned. He talks about love. Love the Lord your God. Everyone knows this. With all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Another scripture, it says all your strength. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. It says love your neighbor as yourself. And you get caught up in those words. Love your neighbor, but as your, can everyone say yourself? Yeah. Yourself, that, there, that God would have you to love yourself. And it's so easy, you know, and I, I see somebody struggle with something and they can be forgiven and that person can be forgiven. But how about yourself? Can you allow yourself to be forgiven? Do you believe that all the sins that you've committed, you know, have been forgiven? And when I talk about rejection, I, I'm not saying that you have to agree with everybody. You know, gosh, I agree with every single position. No, I, I don't agree with everybody. And, you know, and I, I happen to have a very strong personality. Have you noticed that? <laughs> My personality grades on some people. It really does. My personality can really be a thorn in people's flesh. Um, because it's, because I'm strong. I'm opinionated about things. I think things through. And, you know, sometimes people love me or they hate me. And, and I've experienced that too. And, and, Somewhere along the line, you have to be open and growing in repentance so that you don't stay the same because the things you might be doing are abrasive to people or bad to people that they start to reject you because of the way that you're behaving. And it's not that they're rejecting you, but maybe they're avoiding you. And you want to be teachable in those things and have a teachable moment so that you can also be responsive to the Lord and be always growing in the Lord and getting your affirmation from him alone. I love it when people encourage me. I respond to it and I'm appreciative of it. But ultimately, my absolute encourager is the Lord. That's right. Amen? That's right. I made the mistake as a young Christian um, where people would be discouraging or reject or whatever it was. And I would assume that it was the Lord through them always talking to me. 
And I'd go, oh, you know, it's like a codependent relationship. I guess I'm no good because they say, and I'm no good. So it must be the Lord speaking through them. And I realize that the Lord is always love. Always. He is pure. He is righteous. He is awesome. He is amazing. Now, let me just start with these five statements here. One is, I feel rejected. Okay? That means I feel, I go through rejection, exclusion. I feel unworthy. I feel unwanted. And there are degrees of rejection. Let's say I don't know you and you don't know me and you reject me. It has minimal effect. Someone comes up and they go, eh, I don't like you. I don't, I don't like anything about you. And I go, well, I don't know you and you don't know me. It doesn't bother me. But if I know you and you don't know me and you reject me, then it has a little bit more of effect because I know you and I go, man, I, I know who they are and they're rejecting me even though they don't know who I am. But, but I think that the, the most effect that rejection has is when somebody really knows you and you really know them and they reject you. It, it could be a sibling. It could be a best friend. It could be a relationship that you put your hope in. And all of a sudden you feel that rejection and it's big and it's bigger. I feel rejected. I get rejected. So do you. The next one is I fear being rejected. Okay, you know, once you've been rejected, then all of a sudden you're much more cautious because you're thinking, oh my gosh, I, I might get rejected again. So you have a fear of being rejected. You know, there's a psalm, it's not up there. David says, in my alarm, I said, he said to God, I'm cut off from your sight. Oh no, I'm cut off, Lord. And then he said, oh, but yet you hear me. You remember me, and he, he remembers that the Lord remembers him. And it's like for a moment, you think you're rejected. And Jody will tell you, my, my first five years as a Christian, I think every day I'd go, I don't know how it's going to happen, but in the end, God's going to send me to hell somehow. There's going to be some clause that I didn't understand in the Bible, and I get to the end, and he's going to say, I love you, and I love you, and everyone said he loves you, and all that stuff. But in the end, I'm going to hell. Because God ultimately will reject me. Have you ever felt that way before? And it's why, it's why the truth of the Bible is so important, the fear of being rejected. The, the third one, I kind of mentioned it already, but I pretend I'm not rejected. Okay, I start to build a fabricated personality. I pretend I'm someone better. Accept me. Look at, you know, you rejected this. Well, look at how much better I am now. And don't reject me now. Look at how good I am. And, you know, you come off. Let's say you got rejected in, in school. And then the following year you come back, but you got new clothes. And you start to put hope in your new shoes and your new clothes. And now you're not going to get rejected. You build a personality. And you stop taking risks, too, because you don't want to look bad. So you never step out of any comfort zone, okay? Or like I said before, you pretend that you don't care, okay? You get under-attentive. You say, I don't care what anyone thinks, but you do care. And, and that's a pretending you're not rejected. And then the fourth one here is I reject because I've been rejected. And, and you know... You get rejected, and someone rejects your relationship and rejects who you are, so you reject them back. You know, it's like Jesus turns the other cheek and then dies for them and pays for them at the same time, and he's the example. But my natural bent is if I get rejected, I'm like, oh, yeah, well, then I'll reject you. But I'm a pastor, so I'll do it in a better way. Hi, how you doing? I'll just ignore you and close my heart off to you. Have you done that? Will you just close your heart off to somebody? It's because you're rejecting them. You won't let them in. And the Lord has told me the whole time, since I've been a believer, but especially since I've been in ministry, he goes, Eric, I never want you to be someone who walks with a closed heart. Whether you, whether you think you're going to get beat up or not, you need to be open-hearted to every single person, not just with words, but in the relationship, even if they're hurting you. And that's difficult, isn't it? I, I really do think it's difficult. And so I reject because I've been rejected. I tear down others and build myself up. When I'm in the rejection mode, I reject you. What happens is I feel like I've been put back in control. 
Now you no longer have the edge over me. You no longer have the control over me, rejecting me, and I'm this weak person. Now I'm going to reject you back. I'm the strong person. And I'll close things off with you, and I'm not going to open up to you. People do this with churches. They have a, a hurt relationship in a church, and then they go to a new church, and then they get hurt over there, and then they go to another church, and then finally they go, I should be part of the home group movement, and then they do that. But can I tell you something? When you're hurt in the first church, just stay there and grow through it. Grow through the pain and the rejection and watch God work and change relationships. You know, people are surprised to go, this, this is the only church I've ever been a part of. And I'm not saying just the church we pastored, the church that we came out of and the church we came out of and the church uh, all the way back. I've never said, oh, let's go to a different church because, and, and trust me, I've had times where leaders have hurt me. I've had times when people have hurt me. I've had friends that have hurt me. I've had followers that have hurt me. And there are so many opportunities that I could just say, go, well, I'm just going to go to a different church where I'm not going to get hurt by these people anymore. Instead, the Lord said, no, I want you to grow through the relationship. And people who run, keep running. And you know them. They run from one thing, and then they run to another, and they run to another, and they never find the restoration. And it's, it, as a pastor, it breaks my soul to watch that every time because it's just hurtful for them. And, and I reject because I've been rejected. We resist being loved and loving people. Because when you start to close off your emotions and you start to close off intimacy with people, it's not like you can be intimate with some people, intimate, not intimate with others. You start to just close off your heart. And so what happens is you don't feel being loved because you cut yourself off. Your rejection has cut you off. And you become suspicious. You're, you're always thinking if someone does come close to you, you're thinking, well, they must have some ulterior motive, you know? They talk to me about church. Maybe they want, just want me to come back to church so their attendance can grow or something. Who cares about that stuff? The kingdom's much bigger than that, isn't it? Yeah. Our true self stays hidden. Past hurts. Divorce. Childhood pains linger on. I reject because I'm rejected. And then this last one here is I reject before I'm rejected. You know? I just know you're going to reject me. So I'm going to reject you first. I've had that where as a leader, someone has rejected me and then someone comes and goes, hey, I want to hang out with you. I want to follow you. And I go, well, okay, but let me reject you first. And you don't think I'm going to open my heart because the minute I do, you're just going to burn me like everybody else does. How many have experienced this? Have you experienced it at your work? Have you experienced it in your family? Can you be, God is calling us to be the people who can stand in the face of rejection and remain truly loving, truly empowered, truly filled with life despite the rejection that nothing can harm you because you are safe in the Lord. This is the most important thing I can say today is that God would have you strong in the midst of rejection to overcome it. I've overcome the world, not avoided the world, not avoided the circumstance, but overcome it. Right? All right. And God's plans for me require intimacy, so I can't just close off my heart. And when I do, I start to miss the flow of blessing. Because I'm living in this rejection. Listen, how many can tell me talking about this that I've experienced this? Okay, four of you. The rest I'm trying to convince. No, I'm kidding. You know, I've not only gone through it, but I've seen the victory in it. There's, it's awesome to be able to walk past it and not have that effect where it's destroying your life. You can just enjoy it. Amen? Um, in the Psalms 27.10, my family has rejected me. Though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. That's right. 
And I'm not saying every parent here is this big problem parent. I'm just saying there are times when your parents abandon you. There's times when your spouse is not there for you that moment. And you just only have the Lord. So now should you reject them for not being there for you? Should you reject them for rejecting you if that's what one of their pain was? You know, Jody and I, we, we were going through some hard times early in our relationship where she'd been really hurt. And, and I could tell she'd been hurt by men. And there were times where the Lord would just tell me, I, I want you to stay there and I want you to take whatever pain she's feeling. I want you just to take it. And sometimes you stand in the gap for somebody. Amen? My friends have rejected me. I, I got the scripture in 2 Timothy, but all through scripture, you know this. This is human relations. At my first defense, no one stood with me, but they all forsook me. Right? We're all going to go out in the ministry. We're all going to do this. And we're all going to get, you know, we're going to change the world. We're going to go over there. In the first bit of trouble, people start to bail out. Well, oh, man, I had to do this. And I'm sorry I couldn't be here. And, and I, I wonder many times, you know, when people come to church and people take sometimes going to church casual. And let me tell you why it's so important, not just for your own growth. But do you know that sometimes people visit the church to see if there are any believers there? Yep. If we actually took serious the concept of congregating, yeah. we'd be a church of 50,000 people. And this city would have to wonder what the heck is going on. But because church is, I don't know, I'm going to go. And I, I, listen, I don't care about fishing. I, I don't want to make people feel guilty about not coming. But do you realize that sometimes you're not coming just for yourself? <coughs> Amen? Amen? You're coming for someone else. Right. You're there. You carry the presence of the Lord. He said, may it not be charged against them, but the Lord stood with me and strengthened my mess that me, me, my message might be preached fully through me. My friends have rejected me. It, listen, the next one, it may feel like God is rejecting me. And, you know, we, we draw the picture of hell, you know, where it, it looks like an ultimate rejection, and it is. It's man rejecting God's incredible plan. And redemption and his presence and his spirit. It's the ultimate. I don't want it. I don't want his salvation. I want my own pride. I want my own life. I want my own power. Just to find out that there is no power within you that's worth anything. Not for eternity. It's just corruptible power. And it goes downhill. But, but for, the, for the person who believes in God, it says the Lord disciplines the one he loves, who he's in love relationship with, and he chastens everyone he accepts as a son. There are times when the father is disciplining his kids. And how many have experienced it? God comes in and he's correcting you. And you go, oh, that hurts. He's not rejecting you. He's on your side. You know? He disciplines the son he delights in. And that word specifically is not he condemns he, or eternal judges, eternally judges. It's not that word. It's a discipleship word. He disciplines you for your good. It's like, you know, you join a football team and they, the coach disciplines you so that you'll be in shape. He corrects you. Someone corrects your grammar so that you can speak better. So you be better good in your speaking good. So let me give just a few tips before I get into some, some, a few deeper things here. Step one is we need to allow ourselves to feel the pain of the rejection. You know, we don't need to retaliate and we don't need to reject back, but we need to understand that we're experiencing rejection. Do I hear amen? amen. You have to acknowledge it. You have to understand it. I, I shared the story as a kid how I felt. But I didn't really understand what was going on. I was too young. I didn't really comprehend it or I wasn't instructed. I didn't know. I just knew I didn't feel good. I just knew I was avoiding people. I just knew I was reacting. But we need to understand I'm experiencing rejection. I feel rejection. And step two, and here's the humble thing. How could this rejection be helping me? 
Sometimes people point something out in you. While it may not be all the way true, it has elements of truth. You know, someone says, you know, uh, they reject you because of this. Now, sometimes you just need to ignore it and say, nothing's helping me. It's just vindictive. But there are other times when it's constructive. And you go, you know what? Maybe I could be teachable and learn something from this. Do you agree? It's, it's humility. The wise man listens and he grows wiser still, right? He's not afraid. And the wise man also draws out understanding. He goes into deep waters and pulls things out. So what are you saying? Why You're rejecting me. Why? Because of this and this. I need to pull that out so that I can see. And then personally, step three, you need to accept God's grace and forgiveness for yourself. No matter what anyone ever points out to you that you might need to grow, it should never harm you because it's always a good thing. Amen? Because you always have forgiveness because of the cross. So we don't need to be rejecting you know, input. No, don't tell me this. Don't tell me that. I don't need to hear that. And I, that means your hope is in yourself. You're proving that your hope is in yourself. When your hope is in the Lord, you know that you're forgiven. It's okay to be wrong. That's why I hate the church movement that puts these banners up that says, you know, we're the great church that believes in marriage and this and that. And we believe in all those things. But you act as if you've got it down in the world's all the sinners. I look around and I see the sinners right here. Right? And that's, and I'm not saying that they should indulge in the sin. If you hear me saying that, you don't hear me. I'm just saying, honestly, we're the brokenhearted. He comes to heal the brokenhearted. He doesn't come to heal the religious right. Or whatever you want to call it. I don't follow politics, so I don't maybe I said the wrong phrase. I don't know. (laughs) But you know the ones. It's like you stand for the cause and you pretend like you do it all. Now there's nothing wrong with standing for good virtues as long as you say, and I blow it too. But the minute you think you're doing it and you condemn other people, the Bible says you're condemning yourself. That's a scary thought. Accept God's grace and forgiveness for yourself. How many need God's forgiveness right now for something? Come on. Can you just say, Lord, I accept it? Just say it. Say thanks. This is why it's the will of God for you to be thankful because you're thankful that God is forgiving you. You're thankful for the grace. And then step four, you have to accept and forgive the person who's rejecting you. I, 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 it's easy to forgive them. It's hard to accept them. But you have to. Number one here, and this is where I, I'm going to just start wrapping things up. I want to ask some deeper questions here. We talk about personal rejection, and it's true. But have I rejected God? Look at this picture. It says, he was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hid their faces, he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. This is a picture of Jesus. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Wait, he was rejected. We didn't care that much about him. We didn't hold him in high esteem. He bore our pain. Like, that doesn't match. The next line should be, and he was ticked off because he was God, and then lightning bolts flew from the heavens. (laughs) Right? Isn't that what the next line should be? We esteemed him not. He Right? It says, but surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet, when we saw it, when we saw him punished, we considered him punished by God. Oh, there's a person going through a hard time. They must be being punished by God. Yeah, that's what's happening. He must be stricken by God. He must be afflicted. John 1.11 says, He came to his own people, and even they rejected him. But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. John 13.20 says, Very Truly, I tell you, whoever accepts anyone I send accepts me. And there's the, 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 con, the words at the opposite, the antonyms. It's rejection, 
acceptance. Have we rejected God or have we accepted him? Have we accepted who he is or do we want to redefine him? He doesn't picture what I want him to be, so let's redefine him. My spouse isn't everything I want her to be, so I'm going to try to redefine her. She needs to start doing this more. She needs to start being this more. Oh, my friends, I don't like them. I'm just going to get new friends because they aren't like this. It's like God, he says, whoever accepts anyone I send accepts me. And whoever accepts me accepts the one who sent me. And I know this scripture, and I've talked to people where I, I'm presenting them the gospel, and they're rejecting it. And I want to tell them, when you reject me as I'm doing this message, you're rejecting the one who sent me. You're rejecting him. I, I'm giving you his truth. And that, that's why, you know, uh, David cries out, Lord, or Isaiah cries out, Lord, who has believed our message? 1 John 4.10, this is love. I mentioned one similar to this last week. It says, we didn't choose him, but he chose us. This is a similar one. He says, this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Does God accept us? Yes, but not just on our own merit. He loves us in that sense, but then makes us right by his sacrifice for our sins. Number two, has God rejected me? The answer is, can everyone just say, no. no, no. As far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions for, uh, from us. Amen, hallelujah. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Uh, just even as we repented here at the beginning of the service, I, I said, Lord, forgive us for our evil. And I'm just thinking, there's probably somebody out there that goes, are you calling me evil? I mean, Hitler's evil. There's gossip shows on TV to talk about what person did this evil thing. You know, it turns out that one mayor or whatever, some story that's out there, you know, he took drugs and stuff. He's that evil one. It's like, really? Really? That's what you think? The evil one is them? And let's get on the show to talk about the evil ones. Wow, there's this basketball player did that. He is an evil one. And can you believe that? You know, he punched his, you know, whatever, his friend, and now he's the evil one. You don't think that you're the evil one who needs redemption? Honestly? I mean, with total sincerity. then these scriptures aren't for you because he says, I'll forgive their wickedness. I'll tell you right now, that's for me. How many here have wickedness, wickedness that they need to be forgiven from? Raise your hand. Okay. Aren't you glad you came to church today? Found out how wicked and evil you were. <laughs> but the good news is that you were forgiven for it. Amen? <laughs> Woo! Amen. And I love this. I will, I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Woo! <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I mean, that means the second prayer that you have, you go, Lord, I'm so sorry. You, and by the way, I think there's a big misconception in the body of Christ where, where confession has its role as the means of sanctification. It is not the means for actually being forgiven. The forgiveness comes to the work of Christ. Amen? Amen? The means with which he uses that redemption that had already taken place is confession. It's, we don't, we're not saved by our confession. You can't reject Christ and then just start confessing things on your own and expect forgiveness. Yeah. Oh, I'm forgiven. No, you're not. Because you have sinned more than you were repenting for, and it's bigger than that, and your, your confession has only has meaning within Christ's redemption. Meaning, if you didn't remember every single sin before you died, God's not going to hold it against you because you lusted after the nurse two seconds before you passed away. Okay? And I'm not saying you should lust after the nurse. I'm just trying to make paint a picture here. Okay? Because you're not saved by your forgiveness, your confession and repentance you're saved by the work of christ amen, amen? amen. 
Okay, almost done here. See what great love the Father has lavished on us. Here's the acceptance that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. Amen? Amen. We're not trying to be children. We are the children of God. Amen. Don't let anybody tell you, oh, we don't know. You're saved, but you're unsaved. You're saved and unsaved. Unsaved, saved. Born again, unborn. Born again, reborn, unborn. No. We're not the cockroach. All right? In the, um, you know, in the yin-yang, whatever theory it is. The Spirit himself, Romans 8, 16 says, testifies with our spirit. When I say these things, your spirit should be confirming this, that we are God's children, And he says, and if we're children, then guess what? Then we're heirs. Because written in the will, on the death of Christ, when he dies, there's a will written. And that will says you are now the heir to what he's done. You're not just an heir on your own heir, but you're actually a co-heir with him. You're a co-heir with Christ. Hebrew says, I'm not ashamed to call you a brethren. You're a brother like me in his humanity. In his divinity, he is God from eternity past and eternity future and all things in between. And in humanity, he is our brother, a co-heir. And, and I love this scripture. It's here. It says, and a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Do you know that the spirit, that same spirit that fell upon Jesus is on you? In them, I am well pleased. I am pleased. Why? How can God be pleased in me? I'm not good enough. He's pleased in me through the work that is Jesus. And he, when the spirit and the dove come upon Jesus, Jesus, you know, I don't need this. Or when he's getting baptized, I don't need this. And he says, this must happen to fulfill all righteousness. And that's what the Spirit is doing. He's fulfilling all righteousness in my soul. He's healing me from rejection as I talk. Every moment of my life, he's healing me from rejection. Every moment, he's healing me from discouragement and despair and bitterness and anxiousness. You Look at Eric Van Rie. In five years, I will not be the same man. I'm not the same man I was five years ago because I cannot continue in that life. The seed of God is in me. Should I reject others? No. Accept one another then just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. And then I just want to close with this last scripture. Uh, We just came back from a pastor's conference. And, you know, it's one of those things that our movement wants us to be a part of on a regular basis because they want us also to have times where we're getting fed by people and by leaders and not having to worry about how it's going to transfer to anyone else. It's just God's doing something in us. And you as a congregation, there's a part of our tithes and offerings that go to send us there so that we can go there. So thank you for sending us. Pastor Jack Hayford is one of our leaders. Some of you may know him. He's a a man of God who's in his 80s now and has been walking with the Lord faithfully for a lot of years. He brought this scripture up, and I'm going to put in my own words some of the things that he said about this. When we talk about rejection, the antidote to rejection is acceptance. Amen? Amen? Acceptance comes by love. Love is the communicator and the glue and the force on both ends that holds together acceptance and diminishes rejection. You can't always get it from people, but you can always get it from God. The power that secures that love for you is the cross because your sins are removed. You're no longer under the wrath of God. You're no longer under the condemnation of God. You are only under the acceptance of God and he is in you and he will never ever leave you because he's not in you because of what you did. And as long you know, some of you guys come from religious past, I understand, and you think God's leaving you You know, every time you do something wrong and you go, oh, no, he's gone. And there's a difference between the koinia fellowship where, where God sometimes removes the feeling of himself, but he's still there. 
And how many have felt like you go, man, it feels like God's gone, but I know he's here with me. And he'll never leave you nor ever forsake you. And during this conference that, you know, we talk a lot about, and churches talk about it, and Christians talk about it, how we got to love our city, you know, and we got to love, you know, love the color of our skin. Make sure that, you know, we love the people who don't look like us, all, all the important things. And I, I've, you know, understanding the Bible, I don't understand how anyone could be racist because we all come from the same person. Amen. Who cares what the color of your skin is? It's the man or it's the woman inside. That stuff does not matter at all. It's not, it does not matter. And I know people rally around it, and that's fine. That's our culture. But as much as we rally to love our city and love the brokenhearted and love the people we're praying for in Ecuador, can I tell you, the thing that Jesus says, he says, by this, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. By, by what, Jesus? If you love one another, if you love each other, it's so easy to, to put the TV on and see a, a broken child you know, in Ecuador and say, I love that kid. And it's much more difficult to love the person who's right next to you in your life. Amen? Because that's where it really matters. And Jesus says, when you pull that off, everyone will know that you follow me. Because that kind of stuff only happens in kingdom world. It only happens in kingdom world. Now, I'm, I'm telling you, I know that the Lord was speaking through me today. I know it. But I want you to know that he was speaking to you. I want you to respond to him, okay? Hey, I'm Murph, and we really hope that you enjoyed this week's Adventure TV broadcast. We here at The Adventure have two main goals, to love God and to love people, and we hope that you felt that through this week's broadcast. If you would like to join us on Sunday mornings, we have services at 9 and 11, and also on adventurehome.org. Thank you again, and God bless. All creation worships you. All we never came to be. We'll bow before your majesty.